Okay. Um, and where's the control ones? Which ones would you? The bottom sides. Uh, this one here? Yeah, the black one. Okay. Okay. Let's... okay. okay. Oh, the bottom side. Okay. Um, basically, to give you some background for those of you who are not familiar with Del Marva, it's this area here. It's basically a giant sandbar wedge between the Chesapeake, the Delaware Bay, and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, anyhow, uh, the web complex, as it was originally named, uh, uh, has uh, it's basically uh, a corollary would be Kip Island, an intrusive mound. And this just goes to show you some of the the distribution of these sites. And the ones circled are the ones I'm going to be talking about. And probably the the foundational site is the Island Field site, which is on Delaware Bay. It gets its name because it's a slightly elevated hummock surrounded by a tidal marsh that was plowed. It was owned by the Webb family, hence the name uh, Webb Complex. Uh, it was originally excavated by Ron Thomas way back when. This is a young Ron Thomas. This is a young Joe Hughes. I have no idea who this is. Uh, but uh, anyhow, they initially discovered uh, human burials uh, quite uh, quickly just beneath the plow zone. Uh, they ultimately ended up finding 100 and over 140 burials. Um, and these burials were associated with caches of material indicative of similarities between uh, Kip Island and Intrusive Mound, including platform pipes and various other things, uh, antler and, and uh, antler flapping tools. Um, and here's a picture of one of the platform pipes in situ with uh, the pelvic region of a poorly preserved uh, individual. Uh, other materials, whelk shell cups, whelk beads, tessels, harpoons, antler tines, fish, uh, fish hooks, and uh, great white shark's teeth, uh, your typical celts or adzes. Uh, a lot of these kind of things you would call pendants, however they have these little teeth on one end. And then large jack's reef or uh, pentagonal knives. Uh, if you can't see the scale, but it's 10 centimeters. Uh, this thing is about nine inches long. Uh, here's a picture of one of the caches, one of the largest caches, which was associated with a female. Uh, this is burial cache 44, which produced a day uh, 590 Cal AD. Uh, in this cache included, included a variety of, of items um, uh, that you see here. Uh, some of the interesting things reported in Jay Custer's reanalysis of the site was a tundra, articulated tundra swan wing. Uh, so maybe it was something like that. You know, maybe they had a, you know, a wing like this or, or a fan. Uh, he, Jay also found the distal phalanges of Felis cunculor, a uh, uh, mountain lion. Uh, it was high and probably wrapping. Uh, so, that sort of served as a foundation for one of the larger sites, but there are a lot of other sites that people don't know much about. And the other, probably the largest Jack Street site in the Chesapeake is at Riverton. And Riverton is here, a little town uh, on the Nanticoke River where the Marshy Hope and Nanticoke uh, River coalesce. Uh, back in the 1950s, a gentleman building a chicken house decided to mine sand, and he lined his chicken house, and as he was spreading the sand, he found uh, numerous Jack's Reef points, uh, literally hundreds of these. Um, and you can see some of these things are fairly large. This one's about three inches, I guess. Um, and some of them are not, some of them are not. Then these are kind of interesting, these very thick kind of discoidal cores. They're usually kind of turtly shaped. They have a flat side and a dome side. Uh, pendants with these little tally marks at the or teeth on one end. Platform pipes, I think there were a total of 18 platform pipes from this site uh, with their typical doodles. Some of them had been mended, uh, some of them were slightly curved and small in size, and Jay Custer illustrated these uh, from, from the site that, in the University of Delaware collections. Also like Island Field, these large knives, uh, here's one here and then here's one here, hands in for scale, or old ladies' hands in for scale. Uh, what's interesting about this piece is that it was analyzed, and this is the southernmost occurrence of Rama Chert from Labrador, uh, which is 2,000 miles to the north. Another site, the Oxford site, it's on the, uh, the Chesapeake side. This is a plowed field uh, in the eroded bank profile. 
Uh, back in the 90s, there were several burials. There were burials that have been washing out here for years. And basically, you've got a series of these stacked burials. Some is cremation, there's an articulated one, and then there's a bundle burial. Uh, you hear they are zoomed in for uh, your purposes of looking. You also see these little pendants with these key platform pipes, cells. And yet again, these large bifaces, which are indicative of the one from Riverton and also from Island Field. Almost, this one actually is almost a duplicate, the same material, sort of a dark chalcedony. Uh, recently, in the last three to five years, when they stabilized the shoreline, uh, this was literally the day of the last time to see the shoreline. Uh, I walked down there, and in this area here, found these few items. Um, and we ultimately dated a section of a third harpoon head using bone collagen date. Got a date of 619 AD, plus or minus 22 years. Uh, another site, Wheatley's Point, it's an eroded uh, peninsula, upland hummock, surrounded by a tidal marsh. You, you can see from the erosion, all of this is prehistoric debris, uh, refuse midden, firecrack rock. You can see it here. Here's a platform pipe that eroded out of this bank. Uh, you can see here, here's the erosion. If you look behind this thing, you'll see that thing. And that turns out to be a large jasper knife. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of that stuff was out here on display of uh, some of the material from that location. Um, other items, an antler adze blade. Um, I have no idea. Uh, shell beads, more platform pipes. And then the final site, which I spent several years working on, I say the final, there will be actually two more, but two sites in this area here uh, that I've worked several years on. These are massive fishing encampments on the Atlantic Sea Coast. Uh, this is the site, uh, 44 and H440, or what we call the upper ridge site. This is it, a high tide. You can't excavate. You wait for the tide to go out, and then you can excavate. Uh, sea levels were lower during this web complex uh, era, this 500 AD uh, period to roughly, say, 900 AD, between about five and three feet lower. So this was a dry upland landscape. And this is basically what's happened through time. They were living there, sea levels rose, people moved in on them, and they ultimately got drowned. Uh, here's the drowned midden. This is an actual organic midden. This thing is over thickened and literally packed with fish bone, pottery, projectile points, flakes, garbage. Uh, here's an early picture that I took. Here's a pit feature. You can see this, this organic midden extend off into the horizon. This site is a quarter of a mile long. And you can see some of the fish bone material sticking out of the bank profile. We've only tested a few areas here uh, to date the site, determine what sort of fish species. These are some of the units that are laid off here. Uh, this was one assemblage form from one of the small, smaller units that dated to 488 AD. Uh, this all came out of one meter by one meter square. Um, when that same meter by meter square, we found evidence of what sort of fish they're eating. Uh, we have red drum, black drum. Uh, there's some cod that was recorded. Um, bull shark and juvenile great white, Atlantic stingray. Uh, so basically, these folks were really going after some fairly large fish. Juvenile great white is not something you want to fool around with. And they had the tools to do it. They had large bone fish hooks and they had harpoon heads um, and uh, the other stuff that goes along with uh, the typical Jack's Reef assemblage. And then the final site, this one's particularly interesting because it's also drowned, but it's drowned a little bit more. Um, this site will catch hell in about 48 hours on the Atlantic Sea Coast with the hurricane coming up. Uh, here it is at low tide. You can see a live boozy con sinestrum there. Uh, here's some uh, in situ flakes. We've dated this site. Uh, we did organic residue on the inside of ceramics. <laughs> we got a date of 490 Cal AD plus or minus 48 years. This date is essentially the same age as the other site on the a mile away, which is as a crow flies a mile away. And then we dated the drowned upland surface and we got a date of 576 Cal AD. So this is on non-cultural. This is the upland surface, this is cultural. Uh, if you look at these assemblages, you initially think, oh wow, they're using a lot of black chert. Um, however, when you break them open, you realize it's all jasper that's been geochemically altered. This is a large one of those knives. You can see the original jasper on the inside. Here's a piece here, here's a piece here. Uh, so they look black, but they weren't black when they initially uh, uh, made, made these things. They're also manufacturing whelk shell columnella beads. These are micro drills um, uh, that are also found at the site. 
and we have these little ads is this is I just literally found this a couple weeks ago when I was doing some field work down there on another site of actually a Clovis site and uh, this is kind of rectangular cross section very dense heavily polished it's probably one of these ceremonial picks that sort of end section of one which is also indicative of Jack's Reef especially in the, in the Ohio Valley um, so what can we say about Jack's Reef in the Chesapeake Bay region uh, aside from look at these cool sites. First of all, uh, this is the distribution of Jack's Reef density. And just to give you an idea, not to say that there aren't Jack's Reef sites in these gray areas, but the areas that are pink and red are really hot spots. Uh, and to give you an idea of how hot spots are, look like, this one here, which is South Marsh Island, um, this was found by a gentleman walking on the shoreline there. So it gives you an idea that these things are out there in large numbers on some of these islands that are way away from the shoreline and to logistically to get there is a daunting task today. Um, so the bulk of the Jack's Reef points on the eastern shore are probably made, or mostly made of jasper. We can say that with some, some assuredness. Um, also, how did they manufacture these things? So looking at these sites we can reduce or understand their lithic technology and these things from the Riverton site are very important and here's a Jack's Reef point with a flake scar, a ventral surface of a flake scar. Um, and the site down on the Virginia Eastern Shore with the large fishing encampment produced one of these humped shaped cores where they detach the flakes from the surface of it. You can see the flake scar and then they trim them out and they make their projectile point. And this is sort of the Jack's Reef technology. It's a very turtly shaped core, domed. It's sort of pseudo Lavalwa in technique. You drive a flake off of it, that flake serves as your preform for your point. You can see the ventral surface of the flake scar and then you rotate this thing about 90 to 100 degrees and then you drive another flake off. Uh, they also do bipolar technique. Uh, that's because the coastal plains got a lot of pebbles and cobbles. Uh, and there's a little bit of thick bifacial reduction. Not much, but a little bit. Um, so what about the distribution of things? These large knives, there are 29 of them from the eastern shore. The bulk of them come from Riverton, Island Field being the next. But there's a few scattered ones through here. What do they look like? Well, some of these are fairly large in size. They're usually very thin. They're basically Jack's Reef uh, points on steroids is the best way to describe them. Um, and they're also predominantly made of jasper, uh, but there are other materials like ramature and some green material, green on steel cotton mature, thrown in for good name. What about the distribution of Jack's Reef platform pipes? There's about 54 complete ones. There's probably equally many broken ones. Again, Riverton is the epicenter, Island Fields the next, and there are these little isolates throughout. Um, and this is the, sort of the range and gamut of material. You see your typical black colored uh, serpentine talc uh, material, and then you get this tan material as well, thrown in for good nature. Lots of doodles and geometric lines on these things. Uh, sharp teeth, this is the local stuff. There's both fossil and non-fossil. Uh, the fossil forms include predominantly Isurus hostilis, which is the extinct mako, and uh, Carcharodon carcarius, which is the, the, the modern great white, even though it's fossil form. But there are also non-fossil forms. This is from the Whitehurst Ramp, a, a prefunctory tooth, kind of a blurry picture, island field, and these are from the Upper Ridge site in Virginia. Uh, the fossil stuff is probably coming out of this deposit on the Chesapeake, the Calvert Cliffs area. Uh, the non-fossil forms there at, uh, on the Virginia Eastern Shore uh, sharks occur today, uh, and these are some historic photographs taken in the 20th century <coughs> showing people catching uh, sharks, both juvenile great white and bull shark, and other things that were found at that same site, uh, sea turtles and, and uh, drum fish. So sharks occur there today, so that's where these non-fossil forms came from. Some folks have equated that uh, uh, these Jack's Reef folks may have found dead carcasses. If any of you ever caught a shark, you realize that they do not float, they sink. They, don't, they, they lack a swim bladder, so they sink. So the chances of finding one washed up on the shoreline would be like the chance of finding uh, pirate gold in Toledo, Ohio. Um, uh, so anyhow, uh, uh, this, shell species were very important, both fossil and non-fossil. Dentalium shell was very important at the Oxford site. Uh, there's over 180 of the dentalium beads, but they're all fossil forms. So tax Reef folks are utilizing fossil outcrops for some of their shell. Like Powhatan's mantle, which is made out of predominantly fossil shell as well. Uh, but Buzikon uh, and also Marginella are very important. 
And you can see a dense cluster here, plus Island Field and Oxford. Riverton has very little, by the way. Uh, so what about the connections to the far north? 2,000 miles to Rama Bay and <laughs> Chesapeake Bay. Um, we have Rama, this large Rama Chert knife from the, the Riverton site. Plus there at that site on the lower eastern shore, uh, 44 and H440, we've got utilized flakes of Rama Chert. Uh, we have Jack Street pentagonal points, the preforms, plus some devotage um, made out of Rama Chert. Um, when you look at the exotics, the predominant exotic material was Jasper. Uh, however, um, you know, other materials like the serpentine for the pl pipes are very common as well. But you'll see these clusters of really hot spots. Riverton and the sites down here have the most exotic materials. And that may be important. We don't have a date for Riverton, but we do have dates on these. And when you look at the dates on these sites, the earlier sites typically have the corner notch variety points. Uh, those sites down on the Virginia Eastern Shore are dominated by the corner notch variety. As you get later in time, like the later uh, burials at Island Field, you tend to find more of the unnotched varieties. At Oxford, where you have both 50-50, falls somewhere in this range. So you tend to see the earlier sites having these. Plus, the earlier sites tend to have uh, the most exotic material. And the earlier sites fall in this envelope of time. And it's kind of interesting to compare why these folks got this Labrador material. This is the Northern Hemisphere climate record from 510 BC to 1904. Uh, and basically, the time when they get that Rama chert material down to the Chesapeake Bay correlates to a peak warming in the Northern Hemisphere, much warmer than it is today. So maybe that was accessibility. Um, and so did the warmer Northern Hemisphere climate, you know, provide accessibility? Not that these folks ever went there. It might be more accessibility up here among peoples and therefore it, it percolates down the coast. But there's stuff moving up the coast as well. This is in the Smithsonian collection. This is a large Jack Street corner notch point from Maine made out of possibly PA Jasper. This is the Sabro cache from Connecticut, which has Rama Chert plus these Jack Street uh, bifaces on steroids. Um, and so you can see materials moving up the coast, materials moving down the coast. However, it's interesting that the bulk of the material, um, it seems to be more material moving up the coast than what's moving down. So uh, what does this represent? Could this movement of material from the north represent a northeastern Algonquian migration, as some people have suggested? Uh, could this represent a Great Lakes Algonquian migration, which some people have suggested? Or could it represent a uh, spread of a set of ideas among neighbors? When you look at the aerial distribution of Jack's Reef, it encompasses multiple language groups that were documented historically. So whether they were there at the same time, Lord only knows. Um, Basically, whatever all this means, I can say that the Chesapeake Bay region has a very extensive Jack's Reef archaeological presence that starts early on, 480 A.D., uh, 500 A.D. Um, so my advice in assessing the meaning of Jack's Reef and the Del Marva Peninsula in Chesapeake Bay, pick a story and stick with it. <laughs>